Okay, <clears throat> uh, so I will call this meeting to order, and uh, we have an hour and a half or so to uh, for for questioning the minister. Thank you, minister, for coming back. And uh, <clears throat> all I would ask um, this evening is that we respect each other's time, um, so that I don't know if we don't have the standing orders that set certain amounts of time for questions and answers, but just uh, you know, the, the, both the an if everyone respects each other, that would be great. And the NDP is going first this evening, so Ms. Jelenas. Thank you. Long time no see, uh, Minister. Happy to be back. <laughs> nice to be back. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, a half a coffee, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> we, um, um, I, I'd like to more or less continue where I had left off, and that has to do with the warning signs that had gone off. <laughs> I'll start with the freedom of access of information. So on March 25, 2010, the NDP filed a freedom of access of information. We want to know where Dr. Maz's salary has gone. We get an answer back from your ministry on June 2nd that tells us that they have 19 records that were found responsive to our request and that they've also gone to the emergency health services branch and another 13 responsive records were found, but they were not able to grant us access to any of these records. So we're now June 22, 2010. This has been done. Nothing can be shared with us. But that information give you, give Mrs. Patricia Lee, your assistant deputy minister, and Mrs. Janice Crawford, who was director of legal services branch at the time, they, it gives them that information. Did they share that with you? No, and I think it's very important that you understand what a responsive record is. A responsive record does not necessarily mean that we have the information that you're looking for. In fact, when Patricia Lee was here, she testified. If you review her testimony, you will see that she made it clear we did not have those numbers. We did not have those numbers until late December of 2011. So, the so, only, the question, so we did. So, I, 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 res I have a lot of respect for you. I know you're wanting to get at the truth. The truth is, we did not know how much Chris Mazza was making until we got a reply in late December. Uh, I think it was the 22nd, if I'm not correct, of December, following my meeting with the chair and with the COO. So we, we got that number. That number was outrageous. It was f f twice as much almost as the highest paid s hospital CEOs. It was a, an outrageous number. Um, and it, that was the trigger. And that is, when, um, that is when I knew there was something seriously wrong. It was one thing to hide numbers and use lots of legal arguments around why they could do that. It was another thing to have a number that was inexplicable and then to find out later that there were, in addition to that, there were loans, personal loans uh, from Orange to the CEO. I mean, but when I, when I heard how much uh, Chris Mazza was getting paid, that was when I said, the, the party is over send in a forensic audit team within, the, and the forensic audit team started immediately, I think the 23rd of December, mm -hmm. uh, and that was when we started to get the information that I think this committee is aware of now. But, but the point I'm making is that had you asked back then, I mean, we had many people come and testified, wh whether it was Maria came and Rhoda Beecher came this afternoon, and we asked her, did the government ever ask you how much Mr. Mazza, Dr. Mazza was doing? Did, did you ever get a request from the Freedom of Access of Information that the NDP had put forward? They all said the same thing. She knew exactly how to get the number. Had the government asked, she could have shared that, but the government never asked. So, so the question remains, you know, like, we're two, more than two years past now. You're, we're in March of 2010. This information is asked of your ministry because we have a suspicion as to what his salary is at. But yet, nobody goes and asks Orange what the salary is at. That's not, in fact, correct. Uh, we did ask. 
responsive records would indicate that there were questions. We just didn't get answers. And you heard Dr. Mazza here when he testified. He was asked, maybe perhaps by you, how much were you earning? And he still was using a number that, uh, that is far, far less than his compensation. So those numbers were kept hidden. Even when other members of the uh, Orange executive team voluntarily agreed to disclose their salaries, even though technically they weren't required to do that, Dr. Mazza refused. But see, if you agree that the, the salary was one of the, the biggest red flags, and if there was a request to disclose that salary, and you didn't receive the information at that point, uh, the issue is that wouldn't that have set us some alarms that we're asking for this information back in 2010 and we got some responsive records, but they didn't actually give us the information we wanted. Um, the question that my colleague is asking is essentially that once you receive those responsive records that didn't give you the salary, wouldn't it be incumbent on you or your, your officials at the ministry to be like, okay, we're paying the entire budget of Orange. The CEO is not disclosing his salary for whatever reason. We should do something further, like what you did, which was great when you called and said, listen, I want, the I want that salary disclosed now, and you got it disclosed. Why wasn't that done two years ago? Well, hindsight is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, of course, wish I had the information I have now then. Uh, I, do, I do think that it's important that we... Um, learn whatever lessons can be learned of that. We fixed it for Orange. We've made it very clear they are subject to salary disclosure now, so we fixed the problem. So I guess my question back to you is, what are your recommendations going forward that will make sure this never happens again? Well, the recommendation would be that the institution may have people in it that will try to benefit from it financially. Various groups that are outsourced by the ministry may have people who are CEOs that may try to make more money or take more money, that may happen again. But the ministry and the minister will remain the overseers or the, the oversight mechanism. And it's important for the people who are conducting the oversight to remain vigilant because the institutions that we work with may sometimes make mistakes, may do things that are improper, but it's incumbent on the government who's paying the check or footing the bill to put the checks and balances in place. I completely agree, and that is why we have done every step we have taken but since the Auditor General's report, uh, since uh, some of these wrongdoings came to light, we have put in place the right oversight. But, Minister, let's say in other agencies shield this uh, salary, we file another FOI and you still don't get an answer. Why did it sat there? If you, if you did go and ask and you didn't get an answer, why didn't you do something at that time to say, no, you will have to give us uh, that information. That information is information that should be available to the ministry. And, and what can assurance do we have that there's not another two or three oranges out there? So, as I say, hindsight, 2020, yes. When, it, when, it, when that, that salary did not show on the list, um, that is... Will that it happen it. now? Will there be follow-up? If there is a request for uh, a salary I, disclosure and it doesn't come forward, will there be, not only I, from Orange, I, but from I the I can entire? assure you that we will be ever vigilant on that issue. You know, I think, I think it's important. But how can you assure us of that? Minister I, Change, I think that ADM is one, le one lesson that, uh, that we have all learned, is that that was, the f that, was, that was something that, if I could do it again, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have pursued it further. And I suspect that you, as an opposition critic, wish that you had pursued that. I suspect that the Conservative Party, uh, if they could do it again, would have pursued that. We all had access to the same information. So, no, you had access to some record. You were the one. We didn't know if you knew or not. We knew that you had had 19 records, that you were not willing to share those 19 records, we did not know that in those 19 records you never got the answer you wanted. Only you knew that. You, you knew that, that wasn't, they weren't on the Sunshine List. Absolutely. That's why you we filed an You knew they were on the Sunshine List. So, um, and that there was 19 records telling you what their salary was going to be. But I'm going to go to estimates. So, so I, I, just, I just want to be sure. clear also that the FOI process is completely independent from the minister's office. I am not involved, nor is my office involved in FOIs. But so, next time that somebody FOIs a salary from the Sunshine List and they don't get an answer, I'm hoping they'll let you know. 
I, I think that is a very important recommendation that might come out of this committee as a way to move forward. What is the best advice you can give? Not just If me. I don't give you the advice, will you do it anyway? I will absolutely do it anyway. I think you can rest assured. All right. The next one has to do with estimate. Same scenario. Here we are. The NDP asked 47 questions about Orange. You couldn't answer those questions. You promised answers. Those answers never came. That leads us to believe years later that you did get the answer, didn't like what you saw, try working on it or do something, because to think that those answers, those questions were out there and they simply went to the garbage. So, you know, we've been over this territory before. Yes. You um, asked um, my deputy when he appeared about that very issue. Mm -hmm. He said that it should have, it should have been, uh, that it should have been responded to and it wasn't and he apologized for that. That's all I can say as well. But, but here again comes the, you know, like, so is there other oranges out there? Are there or other questions we ask? And both opposition's party actually by that time were asking question about orange. Both of us are kind of expecting answers to come forward. Well, I'll stick with my party. We expect answers to come forward. It doesn't. Then I have a deputy that comes and say, I'm sorry, it didn't come. That's not enough. I want to say, well, next time <laughs> the, the opposition raises 47 questions, we will follow through. We have changed. We have learned. We, we've done something different. Because right now where I sit, it looks like the same thing could be played out by the same player exactly the way it went with Orange a hundred more times. And that's, uh, we all have a role to play. I mean, there is a role for government, there's a role for opposition, there's a role for the, uh, for the Auditor General, there's a role for the media. And, you know, in this case, all of us wish this had come to light sooner, but in fact, it has come to light. And many, many people are no longer employed at, at Orange as a result of that work. So we'd all like to have seen it happen sooner. But in the end, we got to where we needed to get to. So, so just to change track a little bit, um, so Dr. Mazza testified here, and I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with his testimony. One of the issues came up was that he, he testified, and actually not just Dr. Mazza, many other individuals testified, and some uh, bureaucrats also supported this and corroborated that there was uh, regular communication from Orange advising what they were doing in terms of things that are not uh, questionable, in terms of corporate restructuring, not numbers that may have been fudged, let's put those aside, but we know for certain that the corporate restructuring that resulted in uh, the salary of Dr. Mazza being hidden that restructuring was disclosed to the ministry. Um, the for-profit entities were all disclosed to the, to the, to the and ministry. And to the opposition parties. Yes. And uh, the uh, new strategy of integrating the aircraft side into Orange was all disclosed to the ministry. And all throughout, every step of the way, um, Dr. Mazza testified that the ministry was apprised of the direction that Orange was taking and the structure in which they were setting everything up. Now, first of all, do you agree that you were, you and your ministry were apprised while you were a minister from 2009 to 2012, that in that time period, or 2011, my apologies, uh, during that time period, those two years, you were apprised of what was going on at Orange in terms of overall structure and strategy? There were parts of Orange's information that we did get, numbers not always accurate, some stuff hidden, but the, the what really went bad at Orange, the really rotten part of Orange, were items that were never disclosed. Which were? And if you, well, I mean, think about this for a second. Do you think that if I had had a conversation with Chris Mazza, he would have said to me now, don't tell your ministry officials because I'm not telling them, and don't tell the Auditor General, but I am paying myself a huge salary. But Do you think he would have said that? Instead of saying that. Do you think he that, would have said, not only am I getting this huge salary, way bigger than any hospital CEO, I've also got this fantastic agreement where they're loaning me money to pay for my house renovations. Do you really think he would have told me that? Well, what he did tell you, though, is that I'm going to restructure Orange so that I can hide my salary. No, that he, is not what he, he said. He very clearly indicated that there would be a new structure that was going to be in place that would shield 
um, him from having disclosed his salary. That was presented to the ministry. That, that new structure was presented to the ministry, which in fact allowed him, gave him the opportunity to shield his income. That was disclosed. The, the, the new use of uh, the new strategy of how to purchase um, the aircraft and integrate that into Orange, that whole strategy was disclosed. The idea of having the for-profit entities in different countries and going out and seeking business in Brazil and going to you know, Jacksonville and going to Atlanta, all that was disclosed to the ministry. And so you had those flags. So I, th I think it's really important that we distinguish between um, what their plan was for exporting Ontario success to the rest of the world. I mean, that was something we were aware of. We were also aware of the establishment of a, of a foundation that would raise money, that would generate money, that would be fed back to the Ontario Air Ambulance Service. That, he, it, we were informed of that. We were not, uh, um, it was a, a fait accompli. We were not, we were informed of it and it was made very clear. This is nothing to do with that contract we have with you to deliver air ambulance services. What was completely hidden were all of the other issues that came to light when the forensic audit team went in, when the auditor general went in. There were some very unsavory practices that we're all very familiar with now that were never disclosed to the ministry and never disclosed by Chris Mazza. It was after Chris Mazza was ousted that that information, much of that information came to light. But we also have like in, like a dozen whistleblowers that have come to committee that has said that they have gone to your ministry and they told you that Orange was running amok. But here again, none of that information triggered any action. They're starting to pile up an FOI that triggers no action, a pile of question and estimate that trigger no action, whistleblowers, at least a dozen of them, that triggers no action. I can tell you that every time there was a correspondence from an employee at Orange, it was investigated every single time. I can also tell you that information was passed on to the Auditor General. We knew the Auditor General was doing an audit of Orange, and uh, we passed information on to the Auditor General. Yeah, but we're now in the spring of 2011, by the time the Auditor General goes in. Then there's the briefing that uh, uh, Mr. Cleese uh, shared with you this morning. I mean, you've now had almost six hours to look at it. Can you place this briefing a little bit better as to uh, uh, if you've seen it before, if you know what this is about? The document that Mr. Cleese tabled today? Correct. Uh, yes, I can tell you that the ministry prepared these documents as they were preparing for the Auditor General's um, report. I can tell you that there are uh, lots of uh, reports in the ministry that I would not see. There's lots I do see, but there is a lot of information that I do not see, and I think any minister of any ministry, no matter what size, would say that they do get, um, they get information after a lot of work has, been, has happened within the ministry. So I, I, this, I, document, this document was never intended for me personally as a minister to see. It was meant for senior ministry officials as they, uh, as they uh, prepared for the auditor's report. You know, I, I have to say that this is just one more example of Mr. Klee's fizzled bombshell. He drops a bombshell with great fanfare, all sorts of uh, bluster, but then when we actually look into it, we see that there might be a shred of truth, but there is v almost never the whole story there. This is just one more example. What I can tell you is that the ministry officials subsequently um, confirmed Orange Issuer Trust is the bond issuer. The ministry is not a guarantor. The government of Ontario is not a guarantor. Taxpayers are protected. Now, Mr. Cleese wanted to, yet again, put information out there that was not true, and we saw that again this morning. So we have an FOI request that triggers nothing. We have estimate question that triggers nothing. We have whistleblower that triggers nothing. We have top official working on threats to the ministry regarding Orange. We have uh, NMP also. The audit did say some good things, but they also said that 
there would needed to be better communication about the obligation under the performance agreement, but we see no evidence that there is action that were actually put into place after that audit was done. So we have made and, and you're on your last uh, minute. Uh, minute? Okay. Yes. Okay. So we have made significant progress. The Auditor General and it's clear that the original performance agreement did not foresee the new structure and it simply was not adequate. We have rectified that. We have much stronger performance oversight there now. We have the ability on the old performance agreement, we had to give them three years notice to terminate the agreement. We now can amend the performance agreement. Government can amend the performance agreement unilaterally. We don't have to negotiate it with Orange. But it, it still leaves us with the oversight. impression that for two years, you didn't know what was going on at Orange, although lots of red flags was going up. We, it leaves us with the impression that there were things going on within your ministry that they should have flagged to you, that they did not fly to, that they did not flag. It leaves us with the impression that you did not know what was going on, although your main role is to have oversight and I don't want you to know every detail, that's not what a minister is there for, but when there are so many red flags going up, I would have liked faster action, faster than December of 2011, at least before uh, quality of care started to go downhill to the point where it did. So I would just say we've all have got a part to play in this, and that includes members of opposition. You had information, you did not act on it either. You did not ask questions. You did not pursue it in the legislature. So we all have a part of this. We all have a part of this. <clears throat> now we'll move on to the government uh, who would like to ask questions. In the government. Yes, thank you. Ms. Sandals. Um, so thank you for your uh, quickly scheduled return trip well, to the Well, thank committee. you all for being here again. <laughs> We're just all sitting here with bated breath. But uh, during your introductory remarks this morning, uh, you highlighted six areas of reform that you are implementing in order to turn the corner at Orange. And uh, I'd like to go and have a bit of a uh, closer look at those six areas of reform. Um, and but before we do that, I'll, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. You really spoke very passionately this morning about your resolve to improve things at Orange, and I think we all felt that uh, passion. And you said that reflected on the fact that there's much more to do. And you called on us as a committee, you pointed out that uh, we've been at this for four months doing public hearings, 70 hours of testimony, uh, I think we're up over 600 pages of transcripts now, and it's time that we start to think about looking at solutions. So we've heard from, um, I think, pretty much all the major players as of this afternoon. We've got a few more people we'll be hearing from over the next few days, but we've certainly got senior executives past and present, um, people from the ministry past and present, all the ministers with the exception of uh, Mr. Clement who set this all in place, legal counsel, lobbyists, you name it, they've been here. Um, and I, I think that we've, I agree with you, that we've got to the point where we need to start looking forward, that the committee needs to start focusing on some of the recommendations that we should be making uh, to the legislature. And I've actually brought, since you were here this morning, uh, tabled a motion that we'll be debating tomorrow morning, uh, bright and early, uh, to try and move on to um, working on just that, working on the report writing phase of the committee's work. Um, but before we do that, one of the things that my colleague uh, Phil McNeely introduced today was a re letter that we all received yesterday uh, from a pilot from Thunder Bay. And I think it reflects, in part, it, it reflects first of all on recognizing uh, the work that you've done because he does say the Honorable Dead 
Deb Matthews' installation of Mr. McCurley as interim CEO, CEO, and the major corporate restructuring that followed gave us a sense of hope that we would be able to continue to serve the people of Ontario as medevac pilots. But I think he also picked up on the frustration that the frontline workers are, are feeling at Orange as this sort of, as, as we continue to discuss everything negative and uh, seem to be stuck in, in this negative place when what we need to do is fix the problem. Uh, in the, in the uh, words of Mr. Binderup, what we were not prepared for was the way the media and some members of the provincial government portrayed the operation and what we do. We were portrayed as a burden on the system called a safety hazard, an accident waiting to happen. We have been misrepresented by the press and have even been jeered publicly. And there have been many other derogatory statements made about the operation or the aircraft. In one case this spring, there was an accident by one of the private carriers, which prompted an article in a rural newspaper which actually showed one of our aircraft, that is the orange aircraft, and stated that an orange PC-12 was involved in an accident, completely misrepresenting our operation, and especially the level of safety we work so hard to maintain. I have read online comments to articles printed about Orange where the public has commented that we all deserve to be fired. And the, for the most part, we were powerless to defend ourselves. He goes on later in the letter to talk about the aircraft because one of the things that we've heard repeatedly from Mr. Cleese is a criticism of the aircraft themselves. And as one of the pilots of those aircraft, he said, we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The aircraft that we fly, the Pilatus PC-12NG, is one of the most state-of-the-art aircraft in its class. With this aircraft, we have more technology and safety features at our fingertips than many of the airliners in operation at the major airlines today. Our maintenance, de maintenance department is second to none and keeps these aircraft in top condition. The aircraft is extremely well suited to the types of flying we do. A mission can take us into a northern reserve with its gravel, or in the case of winter, snow-covered runways, one minute, and then major airports like Pearson International the next. And not only is the, um, and not only is the aircraft top-notch, our flight crews are equally trained to be ready for any mission. We have some of the highest-time PC-12 pilots in Canada. To my knowledge, we're the only PC-12 operator in Canada that sends all of its flight crew, captains and first officers alike, for simulator training before they even set foot in the actual aircraft. Transport Canada only requires captains to receive simulator training. And our crews always keep the highest level of safety at the forefront of everything they do. We fly in many adverse weather conditions all year round that require the best of any pilot. And we do it because that's our job. We are medevac pilots. That there have been issues raised, that there are not enough paramedics to staff all the aircraft that Orange operates. While I cannot speak to optimal staffing levels, I can say that there are many, many cases where the weather precludes the helicopters from being able to respond to a call, where the PC-12 aircraft is subsequently dispatched. And yes, in those cases, it is often the helicopter medics that are dispatched on the PC-12. For our part, we are there to fly aircraft and respond to the calls of people all over the province of Ontario who may need us. And if we can respond to that call safely, then we do. All you need to do is go to the Orange website to see how many thousands of miles we fly each and every day serving the needs of the people of Ontario. And what struck me, because often we will get letters from people and uh, obviously this was a very articulate letter from somebody who really um, 
passionately wanted to defend the, the fixed-wing aircraft pilots out there that are working so hard. What really struck me was this morning we got a flood of Eli emails from other aircraft pilots saying they agreed with this letter, they supported it, so you could feel that um, the aircraft pilots wanted to speak out and wanted the committee to know that they have um, a lot of faith and a lot of pride in the sy system. Um, the, the responses that we got um, were from some places identified where they were from. We heard from Thunder Bay, pilots in Sioux Lookout, pilots in Timmins, uh, pilots who didn't necessarily identify where they were from, but it wasn't just pilots at one base. We're clearly hearing in these responses from pilots from all over the place. Um, I uh, quoted one pilot from Thunder Bay earlier this afternoon when you weren't here, but he made a really interesting conversation or comment. He said, I have flown as a medevac pilot on and off since the mid-90s. It was not better 18 years ago or four years ago. It is better now. So um, this idea that we should just go back to the good old days. Quickly, uh, just going through these, I 100% support everything that Paul Eric has stated. Uh, another one from Timmins, I, I support this letter. I support your letter to the Standing Committee. It goes on, there's about 25 of them. I 100 support this letter. Um, and it goes on and on, 100% support, fully support. I want the Standing Committee to know what I think. I support, I support. Um, on, you know, page after page of I support uh, what Captain Binderup has set to the Standing Committee. There was one here that was interesting because we had one witness who talked this afternoon about um, difficulties in, in, you know, did, pe did pilots want to work for Orange? And this is uh, somebody who said, after careful deliberation of the pilot letter to the Standing Committee, in conjunction with transpired events over the past few months, I would like to formally give you my 100% support. In December 2010, I chose to commit my professional skills and abilities to Orange starting in January 2011. This was based on the decision to make a difference in people's lives. The end result was a move from Alberta to Ontario with the wholehearted support of my family. Despite the negative publicity, I walk with my head high as I identify myself with Orange. I am able to operate a state-of-the-art aircraft in a safe and efficient manner, impacting people's lives. Often this is accomplished when other Orange partners are unable to go due to limiting factors. I would like to thank the Honourable Deb Matthews for all the support she has given to Orange, despite political and media pressure. It is unfortunate that decisions made by former employees have re resulted in the next Ontario scandal. I believe recent managerial changes enacted by Ron McCurley will continue to improve operational efficiencies. I believe the majority of staff is committed to the Orange mission. In my opinion, Another contributing factor is the current economic state, and then he goes on to talk about um, economic factors um, in the province. But, um, and, and I'm not going to read the next of them because I've got as many pages still to go as I've already read. But you can get a flavor of the support that, we, that we've heard for turning things around and the positive way that the f uh, frontline staff are feeling. So if we could go um, back to some of the comments you made when you were here earlier in the day. You first made reference to the fact that we now have a stronger performance agreement in place to govern the relationship between the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and Orange. And I wonder if you can speak to the new provisions that have been added to the performance agreement. Thank you, and I, and I want to say thank you for reading um, those comments from pilots into the record. It's very gratifying to know that, that Orange pilots know that uh, there are people who are doing everything they can to make Orange as good as it can be. And, you know, we are, as I said earlier, we are enormously blessed 
to have the kind of professionals on our front lines, whether they're paramedics or pilots or the engineers who keep the aircraft running or all of the other people who work um, in the communication center and other parts of Orange. They, um, you know, this has been very difficult for them when they have uh, been, uh, their reputations have been called into question. So it's good to know that, uh, um, that they're still there and they're still strong and they are seeing positive change. So on the performance agreement, I think you've all heard a lot about it. I welcome the opportunity to go a little bit deeper into the details. <clears throat> the old performance, performance agreement uh, had a three-year termination clause. We could not uh, terminate the contract uh, any faster than three years. There is now a one-year termination uh, clause. We did not have access under the old performance agreement to vital information. The calls that came in, how many were accepted, how many were refused, and why they were refused if they were refused. Uh, we, there was no obligation for Orange to report all complaints beyond significant adverse events. Now Orange must report everything to us so that we've got information and to speak to uh, to Franz Jelena it was a point we've got information faster now and I think we heard from from Brandon Danoff this morning that sometimes they didn't get answers so now we've got a firm process in place the pr pr previous for, um, performance agreement did not give the government adequate control over the sale of Orange's assets now the new PA gives the government control uh, over the sales of assets above $100,000. Uh, the old performance agreement allowed inspections or audits only twice a year. The ministry can now inspect any time. There was no oversight of the for-profit entities. Uh, those entities are being wound down, but in the meantime, we do have oversight. Uh, there were no restrictions on assuming debt. There was no patient advocate. There were insufficient indicators and standards. There was simply not enough information uh, that was being requested that was required to be reported under the old agreement, and it was not um, in a time. It was not coming in a timely basis. There was no public reporting of expenses, and there was no requirement for a quality improvement plan. So we have made uh, a, a much stronger performance agreement. You know, the other problems were that th there was a culture of confrontation, and uh, both the uh, Auditor General and the Ministry officials report that uh, when, when questions were asked, they responded with legal documents of many, many, many pages long. So they took a very legalistic, obstructionist approach to, uh, to the oversight. They, um, there was a, I think a, to say it was a combative relationship, I think is uh, not overstating it. Uh, they did not provide accurate financial and operational information. The, um, so we, we, uh, there were other problems, but I can tell you we now have a, a, there will be a new patient advocate. There will be new public reporting, uh, improved reporting of emergency dispatch, dispatch information. And so they are now required to include canceled flights, uh, declined uh, air and land ambulance calls. So we have the information we need to make um, judgments about their performance. Uh, there's a quality improvement committee to advise the board, and that uh, that is being undertaken by Dr. Barry McClellan, who uh, many would say is the international leader on this. Uh, we are linking executive compensation <coughs> to um, uh, we're, ex we're linking executive compensation to those public performance targets. Uh, we're giving the uh, ministry the ability to recover funding based on performance. We're ensuring full compliance with the broader public sector accountability act. We're requiring regular detailed financial, financial reports and creating new financial planning controls. Now we do have legislation that is sitting there waiting to be passed. I'm very anxious to get that le legislation passed. It protects whistleblowers, and I think we all now know how important it is that anyone at Orange can speak freely when they see a problem uh, without any fear of retribution. 
Uh, we are now uh, um, have the ability to appoint uh, members to the or, or we will under the new legislation have the ability to appoint members to the board. Um, we can change the performance agreement whenever we deem it necessary. We do not have to negotiate that with Orange. And you know, a tool that I don't like to use, I have had to use it a handful of times as minister, is the power to appoint a supervisor when I feel it's in the interests of Ontarians to appoint a supervisor to, uh, to an organization. I recently had to do it in your area Wellington -Waterloo uh, with, CCAC. with the CCAC in Wellington Waterloo. Uh, it is not something I like to do, but sometimes that step must be taken. So it would give the minister the power to appoint a supervisor. So, you know, the, the, the Auditor General did identify this as a, as a problem, and we have fixed that problem. And we, uh, we, we very much um, look forward to a new era of accountability at Orange. Because, you know, as we all know, this is a service that is of vital importance. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the uh, opposition. Then, uh, Mr. Please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, minister, you became minister in October uh, 2009, is that correct? Yes. Uh, in those intervening years uh, since then, the Premier's office met with Orange. Uh, the Premier uh, met with uh, Chris Mazza. Uh, the Minister of Finance uh, met with Orange. Uh, officials from the Ministry of Finance met with Orange. Officials from the Cabinet Office met with Orange, and officials from your department met with Orange. It seems the only person in this government who never met with Orange is the minister, uh, namely yourself. Uh, here we have people from across uh, the government uh, over a period of uh, nearly two and a half years a meeting with uh, an organization that's responsible for $150 million of taxpayers' uh, money uh, to oversee and administer our air ambulance service, uh, and you uh, never met. In fact, according to uh, Chris Mazza, you refused to meet him uh, when he called on you uh, for a meeting. Why is that? Well, uh, as I said earlier, I think this might be the third time I've been over this, but I'm more than happy to answer the question again. Uh, I have no recollection of any requests of meetings from, from Dr. Mazza. I do, though, have very clear recollections of two different occasions where I went, one, on one occasion, I went to Orange. I went to the base in London. I fully expected to meet Dr. Mazza there. He did not show up. Uh, on the second occasion, in December of 2011, I had a very clear request to meet with Dr. Mazza because I had some very pointed questions to ask him and some very clear direction to give him. He did not show up at that meeting in my office. So it's a bit disingenuous of Dr. Mazza to, accept, uh, to suggest that I didn't uh, uh, um, meet with him. There were two occasions, very clear occasions, where I expected to meet with him. But let me ask you this. Say I had had a meeting with Dr. Mazza. Say we had had that face-to-face -face meeting. I want to ask you a question. Do you really think, do you really think that Dr. Mazza would have told me everything that he refused to tell anyone else? Do you th really think he would have said to me, now ma'am, now ma'am, don't tell the Auditor General about this, and don't tell your officials about this, and, but just between you and me, I want you to know that I paid more for those aircraft because I didn't think we were paying enough. So my staff, we heard this uh, in testimony, my staff negotiated a lower price and I thought we should pay more. Do you really think he would have told me that? Let me answer Do that. Do you really let, let, think let he would have told me that? Let me, let me answer that. That, uh, that minister is quite a performance that you've just given. Uh, I'll answer it this way. Had you conducted yourself with leadership in that meeting with Dr. Mazza, you would have known what questions to ask him very specifically. You would not have allowed him to play that game. What you should have done if he didn't show up for a meeting is to get on the phone, to get on the phone and say, Chris Mazza, I'm the minister, and let me tell you something. We have entrusted you 
with our air ambulance service. I'm not happy about how you're conducting yourself, and I demand a meeting with you and your board of directors tomorrow. That's what you should have done. You clearly didn't do that, and that means that you did not exercise your leadership responsibilities as the Minister of Health. Well, That's I think it. once again we have a statement that just does not hold water. On December 15th, 2011, that was the date of the meeting that I expected Chris Mazza to show up to, on December 15th. On December 19th, I sent a letter to Orange clarifying the purpose of that meeting. I, on December 21st, I, I directed the forensic auditors into Orange. Uh, on January 11th, less than a month later, Chris Mazza was out of work. Well, so I did do exactly what you're advising me to do. So I'm asking you to apologize, please, and withdraw the allegation. Sure. No, actually I won't, Minister, because December, uh, December 2011 is about two years too late. My point simply is that under your watch, this scam of Dr. Mazza's was allowed to grow. Multi-millions of health care dollars were allowed to be wasted, you should have responded, you should have acted decisively long before December of 2011. I'd like to go back to a question you refused to ask, answer this morning. And that was my question to you, a very simple question. And that was a letter that you received dated May 4th of 2011 from the Ontario Air Transport Association. And you did not answer me when I asked if you responded to the Ontario Air Transport Association. Would you try to do that now, please? I actually did respond that that letter was referred to the Auditor General. To the Auditor General. Why yes. would you not have re re responded uh, to that? As the, It was sent to you, not the Auditor General. They raised uh, uh, issues that I thought the Auditor General ought to have uh, access to that information. Well, let's so talk about some of that General. information. Apart from the many conflicts of interest, that were pointed out in that uh, letter. One of them, this is paragraph eight, states, and I quote, Orange has structured itself. Could you give me a moment, please, to uh, get, uh, do you have another so, copy of that letter there? Uh, we had passed that. Uh, yes, I, I know you, you did. Have, oh, I've got it now, thank you. Uh, paragraph eight, and I quote, Orange has structured itself in a manner that is less than transparent. It has created multiple companies that blur financial accountability and hide what the real cost of its service is. Orange and its affiliated companies need to be audited by the province's auditor as a whole entity. Furthermore, given the medical, quality, care problems and other service issues, it also needs to have an emergency health services branch ambulance service review as required by the Ambulance Act. Now, Minister, if there was nothing else in this letter but that singular paragraph that very clearly from this organization is saying to you as the minister, there are serious problems here in this organization. They are less than transparent. They were talking about multiple companies that have been set up. My question to you is how can you, as the minister of health, not immediately call your deputy into your office and say we need a meeting with Mazza and his board. Immediately there's something wrong here. Why did you not do that? So let me re-quote to you what you just quoted to me. You um, don't have to. I know what it says I quoted to you. The Orange, Orange and its affiliated companies need to be audited by the province's auditor as a whole entity. That's exactly what was going on when this letter was received. It was exactly what was going on. You are trying to make a big deal out of something. I'm trying to make a big deal out of the fact that you, Minister, knew what was going on at Orange long before December 2011, and you did nothing. That's the so point I'm trying to make. These allegations were all investigated. Do you think I should have received the letter in May and immediately fired the board? No, I think you uh, with, should have called I think you should have called Mazza and the board into your boardroom to say, "Look, these are serious allegations. Let's go on to the next one." And that is uh, if we could uh, look at 8 sub 2. And I quote the Air Ambulance Dispatch Center must be put back under the supervision of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to ensure that it is not being interfered with 
and that it is able to book flights in a manner that is in keeping with the best interest of the patient and is economically responsible. Surely, Minister, as the Minister of Health, when you read something like that, does it not dawn on you that you should... It's not a matter of deferring to the Auditor General. His responsibility is not, is not to show leadership. He audits things that are history. What you had an opportunity to do here is to prevent what ultimately the Auditor General had to audit. Why didn't you pick up the phone at that time and say, Chris Mazza, bring your board in here. It sounds like we've got a serious problem. Every one of these allegations from an organization that represents companies that were losing business to Orange, let's be clear about that. Every one of these allegations were, uh, were followed up on. Within months of this letter being received, the entire senior management at Orange was gone. The entire board had been replaced. Now, uh, we took action when we became aware and when we had facts to back up the allegations. You know, hindsight is 2020, and we all know that. I am looking forward to your advice uh, as a committee. I know you'll have personal advice for me. I'm looking at your advice from this committee on what we need to do moving forward. What lessons have we learned? Where, where, um, how, what do we need to do, if anything, in addition to what we have already done to right the ship at Orange? How are we going to make sure that this, mis this does not repeat itself? So, you know, you have, um, have made a career of misrepresenting what is actually happening. That you is know, highly just, offensive, Minister. Just this, that, is this, highly, that is highly you, offensive. You, and as, Chair? If I could just say, if we could keep the language parliamentary, it would be appreciated. Uh, what I, I can say um, is um, you have put politics over patience time and time and time again, just today, you issued a press release. In that press release, you write, lives have been lost. You have no foundation for that whatsoever. The officer of the legislature who is responsible for making that determination has been very clear. I have never before heard of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the coroner having to issue a press release in response to an unfounded allegation from a member of the legislature, but that's exactly what our coroner had to do. Under whose direction? Uh, he com acted completely uh, unilaterally, really, really. completely uh, on his own. And if you are suggesting that uh, I instructed him, uh, think again, because I would never think to do that. Did your office so, have anything to do with these letters that were read into the record here? Uh, these, the these, these letters are, I heard about them just today. No, no one I'm in your very office, pleased. no one in your office had anything to do with that. Uh, I, I am very pleased that these pilots have chosen. I do not know how they originated. I do not know the answer to that. Minister, while but you're I on do the know topic, that the chief the coroner has, has, was forced to refute an allegation that a member of this legislature made him? that the, a false allegation. Who forced the, him? The, if you are suggesting that I'm asking I you, who forced, you said he was the forced chief coroner to do anything, who forced him. No, you forced him. Oh, really? You forced him because you said things like lives have been lost. You said that the coroner had not been involved. You okay, described uh, that as yet another. Members, minister, if you can just hold it for a second. Other members, please keep the commentary to yourself, would be appreciated. And if we could get back to having one person speaking at a time, that would be appreciated as well. I have a question. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, still my floor, is it? It is. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Minister, you raised the issue of, uh, of patience. And uh, you boast uh, a turn, a, a new management team, and uh, things are working better and more efficiently at Orange. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if we could distribute uh, these documents. Just today, uh, Mr. Dearman from uh, Killaloe, um, Ontario, received a letter in the mail. You may recall that uh, the issue of Judy Dearman uh, was raised in the legislature 
she's the lady who died, uh, and whether it was as a result of a delay of Orange being able to airlift her or not, what we don't know is if she would have lived had she had an early response uh, from Orange. Mr. Dearman opened this letter today addressed to his wife, Judy. And in the letter, signed by uh, Mr. McCurley, it says, Dear Judy Dearman, on behalf of Orange, Ontario's Air and Land Transport Medicine Service, I ask for your assistance in evaluating the care and service you recently received during your transport. I can tell you that Mr. Dearman was shocked when he received this in the mail today. He received a call from Mr. McCurley following the incident in which Mr. McCurley apologized. Today he receives this document. I ask you as the minister, something as fundamental as tracking patients, something as fundamental as being able to keep track of those who are deceased should be pretty basic for an organization that draws down $150 million of taxpayers' money. I'd like to know what you have to say to Mr. Dearman tonight. This is extremely unfortunate. This is inexcusable, and uh, I uh, will personally apologize uh, to Mr. Dearman for this. I will follow up with Orange to understand how this possibly could have happened. Thank you. Cheryl Defer. Very well. We'll move on to the uh, NDP. Uh, Ms. Jellemus. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I would like to come back to the corporate structure that was put in place by Orange. Um, would you say that uh, uh, your government or your ministry, I should say, encourage Orange, did you encourage Orange to pursue a for-profit business structure? So I, I can't speak to that because that was created before I became minister. Uh, what I do know is that Ontario has some terrific health care innovation and um, uh, there, uh, there is a there is is a market for this kind of business uh, internationally, and that was the business that uh, that Dr. Mazo was pursuing. So uh, I I cannot I actually now I I might actually uh, um, rethink that answer given a moment because I do recall that Dr. Mazza did. Uh, uh, was pursuing international business, uh, perhaps with, uh, uh, with the knowledge of government. Okay, so if I ask the question again... <laughs> yes, so, so when Orange was established, that was before I was a minister, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't know about that. I, I do believe subsequently there was... Um, uh, there, there may well have been. I would have to get back to you to, to uh, confirm that, but uh, I want to be clear that it, it may well be that there was um, encouragement to, to do that. I just can't speak to that now. Okay, if you think it through, uh, in the two years that you were uh, the Minister of Health, uh, if Ror Orange hadn't run amok like they did, if they had normal salary, if they did not do irregular practice, is the idea of putting forward um, for-profit business structure attached to a not-for-profit, is this something you could support? So I think we have to be very, very careful about that. The intention was that um, money would flow uh, back in to, um, to the air ambulance service that serves Ontarians, like as what happens in, in Alberta. The STARS model, I know, was something that, uh, um, w was something that at the time was, was uh, uh, considered to be an innovative model because it did actually uh, have a separate income stream that supported the, uh, the government-funded operation. Okay, so... But, I, but, I do, but I, what is, what like is important... Looks like you're getting your answer. <laughs> what is important is that we have a clear separation of public money and, and private. So 
so and that's that's when when Orange did come to uh, to brief officials uh, in my ministry on this issue. That was the area that got the most attention in terms of the questions. How are we going to protect taxpayers' dollars? How are we going to ensure that money that Ontario taxpayers are spending on Orange is not spent on any of these other pursuits? And that, of course, as you know, is an area that uh, uh, we, uh, we are not satisfied was, in fact, respected. So what kind of responses, you went exactly the direction I wanted to go, what kind of answer could Orange have ever put forward that would have convinced your, the people who work in your ministry that this corporate structure could in any way make sense? So I think, as I've said before, um, we have some, some wonderful healthcare expertise here. Um, for which there is an international market. People from around the world look at parts of our healthcare system and say that's exactly what we need in their jurisdiction. So there's an appetite for that internationally. What I would always defend, though, is the, the, the separation of the publicly funded service and the for-profit. So that's something that... Uh, but um, how was that done in January of 2011? Here you are, your ministry's officials are there, your DM is there, a bunch of ADMs are there. They're presented the spaghetti of a corporate structure, all for profit, that to this day nobody really can make sense of it. How were they ever convinced that what you want, and I believe that you do want to separate the two, how, how did Orange ever convince them that they had done that? they had separated that your decision and your vision was being carried out. So, so once again, we're going over ground that has been um, gone over before. So let me just remind you what Peter Wallace said, the, deputy minister of, the then Deputy Minister of Finance, when he was asked about this question. And this was on April 18th, 2012. He said, it is not remotely uncommon for broader public sector, sector institutions to create subsidiaries to try and extract value from other areas of public service delivery. This is done routinely. This is Peter Wallace speaking. This is done routinely by other areas of the broader public sector. So the mere creation of a subsidiary or an entity would not, in the general rule, raise red flags. So the, the issue is, where is the pro public money? What is the separation between the, the for-profit and the not-for-profit? How, how would we, and, and I'm not uh, contemplating this going forward, we'd have a lot of work to do to ensure that pu the public was being protected. Okay. Um, and that, those were, of course, the assurances, <clears throat> explicit assurances, in writing, verbally, any way you wanted to, to do it, those were the assurances that were given to us, but and I never, suspect by checked. I suspect by the NDP when they when you received that letter that showed that that very same chart, you received the very same information we did. The Conservative Party. Now you're saying I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Your party received it. Um, uh, the the Progressive Conservative Party received the same document that showed the same structure. So as I said earlier. I am quite prepared to to uh, to accept my share of the blame, but there were many people who had the same information who did not raise issues. So, so if you earlier. accept your share of the blame, can can we expect that there will be changes within the ministry? We know that Orange went bad, and mega changes have been done there. But we also know that the government fell flat. Your ministry fell flat on many accounts. When can we expect changes there? When can we expect reassurance that things have changed? So we have seen significant change. And you've heard from frontline staff who have talked about that. Uh, um, Brandon Danoff this morning uh, had comments to say about what has changed in terms of coverage. Of paramedics. He saw that change. At Orange. I know On changes the, are at Orange. I'm interested in changes in your ministry. So the ministry now has the performance agreement that they need to provide the proper oversight. They are getting access to information from sources they now trust uh, and information, complete information 
real information, not inflated or padded information. They get the information that they are asking for. So they will be able to provide the oversight now that they never could have before. Because Dr. Mazza told us that people within your ministry encourage him to continue with the for-profit. He felt he was encouraged, that he was understood, and he received encouragement for your ministry to keep on. Who did that? Who encouraged them to continue with the for-profit ventures? So I guess my question would be to you is, um, can you really pick and choose what testimony you believe from someone who I think is pretty well established, uh, it's pretty well established that he was not. Um, so you're saying he was never encouraged to continue? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that because I don't know that. But what I can tell you is um, there Could was enough. Could you find out who encouraged him to continue? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to do that. Very I will well. undertake we'll, to do that. <clears throat> we'll move on to the uh, government, and you have 10 minutes. Yes, I can. Oh, okay, yes. thank you. Um, Minister, I wonder if we could um, look at uh, an issue that came up today, uh, which was uh, the issue of how many frontline staff there are. Uh, Mr. Donoff talked about the fact that um, once Mr. McCurley came in that there was a change and that more staff had been added and um, a comfort level that things were moving in the right direction. Mr. Wade, who was here later this afternoon, seemed to be quite sure no new staff had been added from his perspective. Um, I wonder if you've got some accurate information around what if any new staff have been added and what it is that, what are their roles? Yes, so what I can tell you is that Orange employs over 600 staff. Uh, they're paramedics, they're transport medicine physicians, they're pediatric transport paramedics, with, which is a specialty of paramedics. There are pilots for the fixed wings and the rotor, uh, the rotor helicopters, aircraft maintenance engineers, communications officers, and office staff. When it comes to airplane pilots, and we have heard that there were shortages before, there are 45 airplane pilots uh, at full complement. So we are now at the full complement of the air, the, the fixed wing planes. Uh, at helicopter, we have 74 helicopter pilots, which takes us now to 75% of the full complement. So we're making progress, but we've still got some more hiring to do. Uh, paramedics. There are 217 paramedics working at Orange, uh, so that is 10 more than we had this time last year. And um, of course, we have new expertise at the management level. So we've, uh, we've uh, got, of course, the new uh, board of directors, their volunteer board of directors, uh, dedicating um, uh, many, many hours every week to continue the improvement at Orange. Uh, Jim Vare is the new Vice President of Human Resources. Uh, Bruce Farr is a Special Advisor Operations. Now, people in Toronto probably know the name Bruce Farr because he, uh, he has 39 years of experience in EMR. He has a long history of working at uh, Toronto EMS. Very highly respected gentleman. Robert Jaguer is, uh, has recently been hired as a Special Advisor Aviation. He's a pilot, and he's served in executive positions at both Air Canada and Sky Service Airlines. Wayne Howard is a new vice president of uh, finance. He has over 30 years of experience in, uh, um, in finance in the private and broad public sector. So there is a very strong new management team in place, and we are adding paramedics and adding pilots. Thank, thank you very much for that information. So that helps us sort it out. Um, we, we talked earlier about the uh, whole issue of um, where the committee's at and uh, moving on in the report writing process. And you certainly indicated your interest in seeing us move forward quickly. I wonder uh, when, the, when the committee... Um, does get around to writing a report and presumably making recommendations. What areas would you like to see covered and what areas are you looking for recommendations that we might be able to uh, provide you with? 
So I would never want to limit the recommendations yeah. that would come from this committee, but I am very interested in seeing constructive advice on what needs to be done, um, in addition to the advice that we got from the Auditor General, and in addition to the changes that the Board at, uh, at Orange is making. I expect that there will be a lot of overlap because I think there seems to be a pretty strong consensus that uh, we need to move forward on, for example, quality indicators. We have seen tremendous success in our hospitals now that we have a public, publicly reported uh, pr uh, quality improvement metrics in our hospitals. There was a recent report that showed a dramatic decline in C. difficile in our hospitals in large part because hospitals now have their numbers. They know what their rates are, they know how they compare, and they know what they need to do to bring those rates down. I am a huge believer in transparency when it comes to quality indicators, particularly because people who work in healthcare are driven to do their very, very best. I've learned that it's part of the DNA of people who work in healthcare. They, they, they went into to healthcare because they want to do well, by, the, by their patients, and, they, uh, and if there's a way to do better, they want to do better. So having a quality improvement uh, plan in place where there are clear metrics and, uh, and progress towards uh, uh, higher quality. Uh, uh, on, you know, we now have, I think, at Orange, and I think across the healthcare sector, we're really building this notion that you have to keep on improving the quality is continuous quality improvement involving all of the staff because this is not something that can be done just by management. Quality improvement by its very nature it runs throughout the organization. So I would look for advice on quality improvement. Uh, I would also look for advice on what do we need to do to really make it clear that this is a service for patients. You know, a, 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 an observation I have sometimes in healthcare is that sometimes we lose sight of who's paying for this service and who this service is designed to help. So I think we have, you know, I always say there are only two questions I care about. Is this good for patients? And is this good for taxpayers? Are we, are we getting best value for money? So I really would um, welcome any advice you have on how to ensure that this is very much a system that is responsive to the needs of the patients and their families. You know, this people interact with Orange, as someone said in their letter, on the worst day of their life. So let's make sure that we are there in a way that is respectful of patients, that gets patients to the care they need as quickly as possible on what is the worst day of their life. So the a focus on, um, on, on what patients should be able to expect from their air ambulance service. Uh, obviously, any issues, any advice you have when it comes to oversight, uh, you've got the new performance agreement. Uh, are there changes you would recommend to that performance agreement? Uh, I, of course, very much look forward to the legislation, uh, the Bill 50 being passed and coming to committee. I will be very interested to see whether there are changes we need to make in that, uh, in that legislation in response to concerns raised by this committee. So I think you've got... Um, you know, you've got, uh, you've, you've been very thorough. You've sat for a lot of days, I think four months of hearings, uh, many, many, many hours of, uh, of testimony. Everyone has the same goal. They want to make things better for patients. So now I think your task, and it, it will be a challenge, I know, to collect the information, to really give government the very best advice you can. What do we need to do to move forward to give the people of Ontario the air ambulance service they deserve? And one of the great ironies of all those days of testimony is it just happens that where the apartment that I rent in Toronto is situated, it's not unusual that while I'm sitting having breakfast, on my way to orange hearings, I see the helicopter coming in in front of my window and landing on the uh, landing pad on the hospital. And I think, okay, there's another person delivered 
for uh, hospital care in, a, in one of the teaching hospitals on University Avenue. So I know it's still out there working. Exactly. Frank, the running board. <laughs> I've never seen him dangling like that. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. I think that must be about my time. It is indeed. Very well. Uh, we'll move on to the opposition, Mr. Thies. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, um, I would like to go back to that uh, document that I tabled uh, this morning, the one that you hadn't seen. And I, <clears throat> I heard what you said, <coughs> excuse me, in response to Ms. Jelena's uh, <clears throat> question about that. Uh, you said that uh, ministers get many documents. Some they see and some they don't. This happened to be one that uh, you said you didn't see. And yet six of your senior uh, bureaucrats did see it, and it was specifically commissioned uh, by the director of your uh, emergency health services branch <clears throat> in response to uh, uh, your assistant deputy minister. Uh, this document, now that you've had a chance to review it, refers to uh, many specific questions and, and concerns uh, about Orange and what was going on there as reflected in their financial statements. And apart from the loans that it had occurred, um, it, sp it spoke specifically to something that this document contradicts what you have said and what the Minister of Finance has said and what uh, your bureaucrats have said at this committee. And that is that there is no obligation on the part of uh, the government uh, to honor the debt, uh, some $300 million of bond offering. That there is no obligation, there, there is no requirement. This uh, document here makes reference on a number of occasions uh, to the fact that that bond offering uh, relied heavily and, in fact, exclusively on the fact that the only income that Orange uh, could demonstrate is the income from the government of Ontario. In uh, Section 13 of this document, uh, at the very end, I'm going to read it into the record again, and it says this. If Orange is unsuccessful, which we know now that it is, because they're referring to the Orange plan of generating international revenue, uh, and clearly uh, that is not happening. As you said, you're dismantling the four private uh, companies, and it's going to be a not-for-profit organization. And so it says, or if Orange is unsuccessful, and the ministry may have increased expenditures with limited value having been extracted and may need to pay twice for the same assets by being morally, if not legally, obligated to assume liabilities. These are both significant risks and Orange should obtain advice from legal services on this. Now, I know what you've said. You've said that legally, contractually, the government of Ontario is not responsible for that debt. We also know, according to this document and according to the public offering, that this coming year, some $3.2 million uh, of capital has to be repaid to the bondholders in addition to the interest. That has to come from somewhere. There's no other income that Orange has. And I just want to ask you this question. When you get the budget from the new Orange Board of Directors. Will the Ministry of Health agree to pay this additional $3.2 million that Orange is obligated to pay the bondholders? And if so, does that mean that you will increase the budget for Orange by that amount, or will Orange have to claw that back out of their operational budget. So the first thing I want to say is that, uh, that this document was an internal working document. 
in preparation for the Auditor General that reviewed a number of issues. I think it demonstrates that um, my, uh, the officials were looking hard at some of these uh, some of these challenges. It is not a final document. It is a document that uh, was uh, in the in the uh, part of the work of the ministry. I can tell you very very clearly is what was subsequently confirmed is that the or, uh, that orange issuer trust is the bond issuer. The ministry is not a guarantor. The, the government of Ontario is not a guarantor. Taxpayers are protected. So I want to be very clear that when it comes to the budget at Orange, this year we said we're not, we're holding the line, but we are beginning a zero-based budgeting process with Orange to ensure that we have uh, the right amount of money flowing to Orange and not a penny more. But so I do want to ask you again, please give us your best advice. The time has come. You've put, uh, you've made lots of allegations, many of which, in fact, I think virtually all of which have been proven to be unfounded. You've, uh, you've insulted frontline staff. Let me give you another quote. These incidents are happening on a daily basis. Unqualified and inexperienced people are the reason. On the 23rd of February, 2012, you, you intentionally uh, insulted every single person who works at Orange. You've had your fun. You've put politics. This has been wonderful, I'm sure, for you. It is time now to put good policy ahead of political ambitions. Minister. I look forward to the recommendations of this committee. I very much want to, to build on the wisdom that you have all uh, uh, acquired during your many, many, many hours of testimony. That comes, it is time to move forward, that comes, and I'm Minister, asking you to move forward. That comes, Minister, from a minister who refuses to accept responsibility for her lack of leadership, her lack of oversight, as the Auditor General said, don't take it from me. Don't take it from me. The ministry failed in its oversight responsibilities. You can be personal as much as you want. The public is observing what has happened. People have died as a result of mismanagement. You the unqualified cannot people, let me finish. I let you finish. You I let you finish. Cannot. You let me You're finish making now. that up. The fact once of the again. matter is, Minister. Minister. Let him finish. The fact of the matter is, Minister, you failed in your oversight responsibilities. You are blaming this on everyone else, whether it's Maza, whether it's the board, even your own bureaucrats. You are defending the indefensible. And at some point, Minister, you may have the character to fess up to the fact that you failed the people of this province. I hope we'll see that day. I doubt it very much. Okay, Minister, Thank you, go ahead and respond, please. I have always said that I, and I have said it many times here and outside of this room as well, I take my full share of responsibility for this. I, I take a full responsibility of making the changes that are necessary to ensure that Orange is the kind of air ambulance service that the people of this province deserve. We've mo we're moving forward. We're seeing progress. I know you don't like it when people say things are getting better, but we've heard it over and over and over again. We are on the right path. We need the help of this committee to get the rest of the way there. I look forward to receiving your report. You fired Maza. You fired the board. It's time to fire yourself. You failed the people of Ontario, and you know it. And if you would at least own up to that, I think you'd get some applause. In the meantime, your lack of character is very, very obvious by how you've conducted yourself in this hearing today. Yeah. And I, we don't need to make uh, personal uh, comments. Uh, Minister, do you want to respond at all? Frank, you're so over the top. Okay. I thank you again, uh, Minister, for coming in this evening. Appreciate you making the trip back from uh, Kitchener. And uh, this uh, committee is adjourned until 8.30 tomorrow morning.
This is the Ontario Parliament Television Network.